Well, stackers, we're on the road this week. You're about to hear a special episode of the Stacky Benjamin Show where we're recording from, well, I don't want to foreshadow too much, but a different location. And in this episode, we're going to talk a lot about the events of Ukraine. We're going to talk about, of course, your money and kind of how to think about those events. But there's a group of people that we need to talk about as well. Every Monday, as you know, we give a shout out to the men and women of our armed forces for protecting us on behalf of Navy Federal Credit Union and the people making podcast here in mom's basement. This time, it's a very, very special shout out because of the uh, so many people right now in harm's way. So here's to those people protecting us and making us safe. Let's go stack some Benjamins together. Well, hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and it's a beautiful day in the basement hood. A beautiful day to stack Benjamins. Oh, won't you be? Oh, won't you be? Won't you be my stacker? Live from the Hampton Inn and Suites in Plano, Texas, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey there, neighbor. Welcome to a fresh eight weeks of shows. For those of you new to the neighborhood, let me show you around. Every show we feature a big interview and wow, do we have a great one today. Want to avoid getting conned by some smooth talking narcissist? Here with her own story about how she fell for a cult and stayed for 22 years, we welcome Radia Gleese. Before that, we always dive into some money headlines, and today, we'll share financial news about the Ukrainian conflict. What are military actions and Russian sanctions doing to your money? While that may not be the most important thing to be worried about, it's the only area we have expertise, so we'll share. And later, we love getting you involved in the show by throwing out the Haven Lifeline. So today, we'll help listener Lacey, who's looking for a smarter way to give money to her nieces and nephews. But of course, the best part of every show, and the only reason you'll be coming back for every episode, is my trivia question. And now, two guys who people see when they look for helpers, it's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G! Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another eight weeks of shows. I am Joe Sal Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter, and hello from Dallas. We're recording this slightly before things go live, and uh, it's also probably OG our last time at the Hampton Inn and Suites because uh, that Doug w- doesn't have an indoor voice. He is <laughs> he is all yelling, that and was- when we get kicked out of here, I'm just going to giggle the whole time because I live down the street and you get to be homeless. And you think your family Hotel-less. heard us down the street? I, I think they did. I think everyone I think did. There's the whole, only the whole, one way to do the intro. The whole my fifth fa- floor. My family's two and a half hours away. They heard you. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, by the way, we do this uh, specifically at the Hampton Inn Suites uh, for two reasons. Number one, it's a high-end hotel. They have free breakfast and everything. OG. But then second, it's because the acoustics in here are phenomenal. <laughs> like, I feel like we're echoing all over the place. But it is what it is. We're on the road for the next several weeks, and we're super excited that you're here along with us. If you want to follow us on the road, it's stackingbenjamins.com slash stacked. We're getting ready for some fun in Dallas, Texas tonight. So, uh, you know, we shouldn't even talk about that, OG, because, man, we had a whole by, t- by the time you hear it, <laughs> the fun had been had. We are gone. You missed it. Yes. But we do have a great show today because there's a bunch of uh, just... The stories coming out of the Ukraine right now are just heart-wrenching, OG, and uh, we certainly, as Doug said earlier, can't do anything about that. But we've also seen the financial markets move a lot. We've seen moves in crypto. We've had stories out of Russia about what's happening in their economy. So we're going to dive into some of these things so that hopefully on the money side, we learn some lessons. We also going to talk about how many times over the years have we talked about scammers on the show and people that have a great sales pitch, like a phenomenal sales pitch about what to do with your money. Roddy Iglesias was in a cult for 22 years and her, her academic background, pretty impressive. And also just her personality, you know, people say I wouldn't fall for that. She's nice enough to come on the show and talk about 
some of the clues that uh, you might want to look for and to tell her story. We got a great show. We're live from the Hampton Inn. But first... And now, a message from Discover about customer service and common sense. When you have credit card questions, it's nice to have them answered by a real person. You know, someone who can actually understand your issues and work to resolve them. In other words, what you don't need is a robot. And that's why Discover offers helpful U.S.-based representatives available 24-7. No wonder we call it live customer service. Discover. Exceptionally common sense. And now a message from Discover about rewards. If you're a loyal credit card customer, you should be rewarded for your loyalty, preferably with something that's useful, like cash back match, for instance. Discover matches all the cash you've earned at the end of your first year. Finally, rewards that make sense. Discover exceptionally common sense. Learn more at discover.com slash match. Limitations apply. All right, we got to get this done before the free breakfast is gone. So let's more get More before moving. the phone rings and they, <laughs> like, sir, sir, we go to the La Quinta down the street. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline today comes to us from msn.com. Of course, these headlines are everywhere. A lot of news over the past week while we were away. Oh, G and Doug, you guys were both probably as as just glued to your news feed as I was all week long. Absolutely. Last week. This one comes from Reuters. Russia seeks to halt investor stampede as sanctions hamper economy. This is written by Carolyn Cohn and Lawrence White. Russia said last Tuesday it was placing temporary curbs on foreigners seeking to exit Russian assets putting the brakes on an accelerating investor exodus driven by crippling Western sanctions imposed over the invasion of Ukraine. Russian assets went into free fall early last week with London listed iShares MSCI Russia ETF. Boy, if you were in the Russia ETF, oops, plunge 50% in one day on Tuesday to hit a fresh record low in Russia's biggest lender, Spurbank, slumping 21% as investors race for the exit. Oh, gee, I would assume... If you've had any, first of all, have you had many calls from your clients asking about not just the stuff going on in Russia, but we've seen U.S. financial markets all over the place. We've had uh, so, you know, the, 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 the fear that's in the media every day just went to 11. Yeah, thankfully, uh, no phone calls for our clients. And I think that's good from a diversification standpoint. Obviously, if you have all of your money in the Russian ETF, you're feeling a little salty right now. But from a uh, diversified standpoint, you're going to have some money in economies that aren't going to do well, and whether it's the kind of their own doing, like Russia choosing to go down this path with the Ukraine. That happens in all different forms and fashions every year in different places, whether it's something that's as as egregious as, as this, or if it's something that's, you know, just uh, an economic issue, you know, Peru or you know, Thailand or whatever, like there's all economic cycles in all these different places. So from an investment standpoint, obviously you have to maintain your diversification and probably rebalance. It sounds really silly, but, but if you've got a portion of your portfolio that's down, you know, 10 or 20% compared to But do you, but do you else, rebalance into the Russian mm, that share? Be, that would be pretty sporty, wouldn't it? Yeah. I mean, if you had it as part of your plan, you might, but I don't know really anybody who who would be that targeted, you know what I mean? Like to, to go through. So here's here's another question people may have. How long would an incident, I call this an incident, economic incident like this have to last before you choose to do a rebalancing? Because what if this lasts another three weeks and the whole thing sort of gets resolved one way or the other, and you've done your rebalancing because you reacted within the first week or two? Is that a little bit aggressive? Should you wait it out a little bit before you rebalance? Well, you can think about it like from the COVID time, you don't have any idea what the bottom looks like, right? Wherever that's going to be. So you just have to have the strategy for when I'm going to tactically do this. And what we do is we assume that when the a section of your portfolio is down more than 20% off of its normal number or up more than 20% off of its normal number. So if you were supposed to have 20% of your portfolio in international and now you have 15, you're down more than that 20 percentage points of that 20, right? 20 of 20 is four. So 16 to 24, you'd let that float. 
And so now if you look at your account and it's at 15% international, yeah, you should rebalance it. And then if you have to rebalance it three times because it keeps going down, that's just part of the deal. But I don't think from an investment standpoint, I don't know of anybody, I'm sure there are people obviously, but I don't know of anybody that's that targeted with their investments to say like, I've got this money in Brazil and this money in China and this money in Canada and this money in Russia. Most people, if they have international exposure, will just have one international fund. But then on the other side of it, you know, the U.S. market's not very strong either you know, over the last couple of months, especially with with inflation. And it seems like from an inflation standpoint, you know, especially around energy, that that's going to continue. So, so it might be a full-on rebalance across your whole portfolio, or you may look and go, well, my tech stuff's down 20%, my Russia stuff, my international stuff's down 20%, my S&P stuff is down 14%. My small cap is down 20%. Like everything's down. There's nothing to rebalance because it's all it's still all proportionally the same. It's just all down, you know? And, and in that case, it's it's just more about continuing your investment plan. Well, I think that's the big thing here to think about, OG, is that volatility just as is, is a investor is part of the game. Obviously, this is not something any of us wanted. It's not something that we saw coming. But we've always said over the last decade, we've said that volatility is going to show up where you didn't think it was going to. And if you're an investor, these are the times when you're tried a little bit. And for people that are new to this game, this game of investing, this is the time I think when you just hold on. You you have to have volatility to have market returns. Because if you didn't, then everything would be fixed and guaranteed. And if everything was fixed and guaranteed, we know what fixed and guaranteed money pays, 0.4, 0.5% in your savings account. So you know you can get one point whatever by buying a treasury bond. Like that's fixed and guaranteed. And so to get 10, to get the compounding, which you need for your plan, because otherwise if you don't have compounding, you have to save all of your money. <laughs> you don't get any benefit of growth. So so this is just the cost of admission. It's, it's funny because it's almost like Helen Russell said when she was on the show talking about how to be sad, right? That you don't know what happiness is unless you're sad. You can't get the upside without the downside, right? I mean, roses without the thorns. Yeah, volatility. Thank you, Bon Jovi. Or is that no? That was poison. Every rose has a thorn. Yes, you were going to say you were looking at me. I want to. Well, yeah, I kind of want to press indoor you. voice, indoor voice. Doug. What? <laughs> this is my voice. I want to make sure that I'm heard. Yeah, you and you can. And I want room five two two to hear me too. They do. Okay, but I'm going to press you a little bit because you didn't answer my question. I, okay. What right. was your so question? How long do I let the volatility go before I rebalance? Because oh, if, oh, it, if it drops down and now suddenly I have 15%, but it's only for two days. Well, you should do it now. That's your threshold. The threshold is that minus 20. That's ours. It doesn't have to be yours. Sure. It's but, whatever your investment policy statement is then, right? Yours is 20. Yeah. Right. But yeah. but it only does that momentarily because a thing happened I mean, within, and it, and it lasted for it, a day or two. Do yeah, I rebalance? If you catch it at that moment, sure. You okay. know, some people won't look at their investment accounts daily, which is a good thing. Some people do it quarterly and just make an assessment every three months or make an assessment once a year or make an assessment, you know, at some interval. If you happen to see it, that day, or you have a Google alert, or you know, you've got some way to kind of glance at it. I wouldn't go through any extra math to to sort it out today versus tomorrow versus you know two weeks from now. But but maybe your antenna's up a little bit because you know, hey, things are down. Some things are down more than others, so there's going to create there's going to be an imbalance. Where am I on that imbalance? And yeah, what I said was during COVID, this happened twice in two weeks. So yeah, there was a point in time where you're like, oh, I'm down 20%. Bam, I get to rebalance. And then it was no more than two weeks later, like, oh, and another 20% off. So rebalance again? Yeah, absolutely. And now then you might not do it again for the next 18 months. It just is what it is. But you know, people listening to this that, that are like, I don't want to pay attention that much. Studies show you don't have to do, do these tactical moves. You could do it once a year and you're, and you're still going to be fine. 100%. Yeah. So if, you're, if your time is I rebalance on July 1st, then to your point, July 1st, you look at it. And if it's still within the tolerances that you think are reasonable, then you let it go. You know, your workplace plan generally speaking, and, and certainly some of the automated plans through Betterment and UBS. See how I did that? Took out Wealthfront, UBS, mm. Betterment, UBS. Yeah. 
you know, we'll have that built in. So it'll automatically rebalance at whatever they think is appropriate. But you can set it up probably in your workplace plan to say, rebalance this automatically every quarter, rebalance it automatically every six months, every year, whatever. But if you're doing it on your own, yeah, you have to have some systems to look at it, something less frequent than every day. Speaking of another aspect of this, you know how we sometimes complain about interest rates on credit cards or interest rates in the United States. This one's from CNBC, written by Natasha Turok. Russia Central Bank, did you see this? More than doubles key interest rate to, wait for it, it was at nine. Their 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 interest rate for their central bank was at nine, sent it to 20 early last for week. For interbank trading? To 20 for Jeez. interbank trading, which so means- the consumer end of that, it's going to even be 30, even more. 30 yeah. something. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And they said the reason for that, by the way, to just cut to the chase on this piece is because they're trying to lure investors. And how do you do that? You raise the interest rate, Mm -hmm. which shows OG. Remember back in 2008 when we saw banks going under 2007, 2008, and you saw these banks were the first to go under. We're offering these huge rates, way bigger than anybody else's. And I remember telling people, if the bank looks too good to be true, th- there's some problem at that bank. I would say there might be some problem <laughs> with the Russian central bank right now. Really going out on a limb on that one, yeah. aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Well, right. and, and, you know, and the problem is, is that it's kind of that self-fulfilling prophecy too, because then, then with high consumer rates, then, those con- then that's going to be tougher to borrow. If there's not borrowing, then there's not, you know, growth that goes with that. And if you already are a lender or a borrower, I should say, and you have the issue that's also happening with the currency, which is that's getting valued less and less relative to other currencies. It becomes more and more difficult to pay back your loan with interest rates that are much higher and a dollar that's worth half as much. You borrow a hundred thousand rubles and now your currency is worth half of it was you got to go make 200,000 to pay back your hundred on PS, the interest rates 30%. So yeah, if it looks too good to be true, there's there's a reason for it from an investing standpoint. If it were a bank, right, in the US, like you were talking about, I mean, obviously banks are guaranteed by the by the government, so that's really not an issue. But I think you're meaning you're talking about the stock of the bank. Yeah. When they're paying their high dividends yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And they put um my favorite is when they put that uh, in a better light and called a high yield. This yes. is a high yield option. You could I'm looking for some high yield. Um, Remember we used to call them junk bonds before the marketers got involved? Hey, uh, Lou, we can't call these junk bonds anymore. Nobody's buying them. What do you got to call them? Ooh, I got an idea. High yield. Michael Milk can mean anything to you. (laughs) High yield. Not to like three quarters of our listeners, I think, but go back and look up that name. You see the stuff he's doing now in education, by the way? That guy's doing some some fantastic work in education. Third piece of this, before we go to our featured guest, this is is from MSN Money. Crypto and blockchain being used in unprecedented ways in the Russia-Ukraine war. The war in Ukraine is the first major conflict of the crypto era, this piece says. And as it happens, Ukraine itself is a cryptocurrency capital. What was a tool of economic growth in peacetime has now with war become another weapon in the fight. They're talking about how people are able to, because they're using crypto, charity and relief efforts are being contributed through decentralized autonomous organizations. That piece is cool. Mm -hmm. On the other side... They are talking about uh, experts in this piece. The Russians also using crypto to try to get around the sanctions. Right. So we get the piece that we talked about earlier. Well, not even earlier, a lot, OG, which is with uh, zero regulation are all these back channels of, uh, of on one side, good people getting money. And on the other side, maybe a regime we don't want having this money still getting it. Yeah, I mean, obviously, from a financial standpoint, the, the kind of cards are on the table. It's a cool thing that there's so much energy pointed toward trying to just really make this painful for the Russian government. Uh, it's obviously a byproduct of that as it kind of hoses the Russian people quite significantly also, um, and any investors and all you know, people trying to get their money out and the <laughs> trading companies are like, yeah, we're not taking, can't. We're not taking trades from you guys right now. I mean... It's not unprecedented to have the stock market close for an extended period of time uh, in the United States. So I'm sure that they can do the same thing in other places. But, you know, you kind of get the good with the bad with that. But it's also a little concerning how quickly the all, all of that came down. <laughs> you know, like what happens if you're on the wrong side of it in the future? And we saw it, you know, as recently as the stuff going on in Canada a couple of weeks ago, good, bad or ugly, whether you agree with it or don't. 
the Canadian government came in and said, well, we're just going to change the financial impacts of this, right? We're going to make it so you can't have bank accounts and you can't use crypto and you can't. And all of a sudden it's like, well, now I don't have any resources. And that's what at a bigger scale, the global scale is happening to the, to the Russian folks. And, and uh, it's kind of scary that, 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 that can as quickly change that. But it's good. It's good for us. Basically, the other 179 countries that are against the one, yeah. it feels pretty good. But what happens if you're the one, you know, 20 years from now and there's enough angst over whatever it is you're doing in Great Britain or in the U.S. or in Mexico or whatever? Can can you kind of gang up on people you don't like? Just like you're the yeah, person wrongfully it's... accused, right? If you're the person in a spot where you're wrongfully accused and you have no recourse. Right. Like, how do you, yeah, how can you... You know, well, you get the you get due process. It's like, yeah, but if I have money to get an attorney, I've got due process. You know, it's like it's like I, the, the public defender may not be you know really that motivated to to do it, but but hopefully it's uh, you know it's more good than bad, right? We're saving saving lives. You don't have to like line up right. in skirmishes formations. Sort of digital to, warfare almost. What well, is? I mean, you yeah. saw like the you know the anonymous hacking group that right. said you know we're we're on the side of Ukraine and we're going to go after you now. You know, yeah, so. they shut down TASS and yeah. RBC and yeah. yeah, lots of takeaways here. But I think uh, the biggest one is that volatility is part of the package. OG, I think we go back to that. It's your friend. That it has to be your friend. I mean, it's be. not fun. The down. Everybody loves upside volatility, by the way. Right. If you didn't notice last year, the S&P was up, what, 20 some odd percent the year before 20 some odd percent. That's also volatility. <laughs> like that's the good kind. That's the stuff we like. But you have to have both sides of it. You have to have the rose, as Doug so succinctly said. Every yeah. rose has a thorn. Sounded nothing like it. So oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't yelling. Sometimes the personality. I'm sorry, you don't have that. Sometimes you have to put personality into. You get a to you get a make know, this engaging. You know make your, people want to listen. There's a reason why they come back role. to the show for me. You got to know your. There's a know reason your why people two floors below. Want to I listen know. to this? We got to make it gauging for them. <laughs> yeah, I think people here at the Hampton Inn listen to really good podcast. You know, whether they want to or whether not, they whether they want to or not. Coming up next, she was in a cult for 22 years, and she's going to tell her story. She was also the subject of a recent documentary that came out and debuted at Sundance. And it is very sad to hear when all the things you thought were true, your whole life gets turned upside down, and you hear some of the the horrible tricks that were played on you. And what's, what's also difficult is that people always say, well, I would never fall for that. Well, that's exactly what our guest said, R Roddy Iglesias. So in just a second, we've got Roddy coming, but first, uh, Doug, take us on a little tour of, uh, what happens here on the show. Stackers, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Each week we come in here singing our song for you, taking off our jackets, putting on our cardigans, taking off our shoes, then getting yelled at because our feet stink, putting our shoes back on, and gathering around the table for special boys and girls who want to stack their Benjamins. Basically, we're the financial Mr. Rogers. -es -es. I'll take my presidential medal of freedom now, please. Mr. Rogers had a lot of help, just like I have help here from Joe and OG. He had Daniel Striped Tiger, King Friday the 8th, and Lady Elaine Fairchild. It was only a problem when Mr. McFeely was on the same episode as Henrietta Pussycat. But other than that, it was usually a great cast, which included some future stars. And you know, the new Batman movie opened recently, which leads us to today's trivia question. Which Batman began his career operating Mr. Rogers' trolley? Well, if keeping up with all the events in the world and keeping on top of your job, keeping on top of all of your obligations is driving you just bonkers, I'll tell you, automation is the key and having the right partner on your team is absolutely huge. And for Navy Federal, they are here to help their members do much better. In fact, they take the legwork out of saving and investing. Navy Federal offers multiple savings products and investing options to help you get closer to your financial goals. And you can put your money to work by automating your savings. We talk about how important automating is. Navy Federal can help you automate your savings. Plus, they offer educational resources to help guide your decisions. 
Learn more at NavyFederal.org slash save and invest. Savings products insured by NCUA. Investment options are available through Navy Federal Investment Services and are not insured by NCUA. Hey there, stackers. I'm children's puppet master and sweater sweater, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. We all made memories with Mr. Rogers, but it was one of the first jobs for this actor, who later went on to become Batman, in two films that brought in tons of money. Tim Burton's 1989 movie and the 1992 sequel, Batman Returns. Though he started as a clown on PBS fundraisers, he went on to be a high-demand actor with a current estimated net worth of $40 million. So which Batman started on Mr. Rogers? None other than Michael Keaton. And now, coming to our neighborhood, let's say hello to a woman who will help us all identify scam artists because she spent 22 years in a cult, Radia Gleese. And here she comes down the stairs to the basement. Radia Gleese is here. How are you? Hi, I'm good, Joe. How are you? Well, I'm great. And I have to tell you, reading your book, Radia, I am fascinated by your life. Uh, there were so many unexpected twists and turns, including, by the way, a stint where you worked in the 1984 Olympics. I was a mounted marshal in the 1984 Olympics. Yeah. And I was also a steeplechase champion. That was, <laughs> you know, <laughs> my first race that I won was at Pebble Beach. Wow. Unbelievable. And what a beautiful place that is too. Gorgeous. Well, and it's so, that's just a hint about the very conversation we're going to have with you today. But, you know, a lot of people think that people that spend time in a cult, that they were duped, that they are somehow dumb to fall for it. Yet we see when it comes to these personalities out there, Radia, that's never the case. And certainly the people that you were surrounded by the 22 years that you were involved in a cult were a lot of very smart people. You know, that's funny, Joe, because I've been interviewed a lot and it's like people go after they talk to me for a while, you know, or if they've read my book, they go, you know, it's wow, Radia, you're so intelligent, you know, and I'm thinking <laughs> uh, that's sort of like, I don't know. Thanks. You know, it's like, oh, you look so good since you lost all that weight. Um, I don't know if it's, you know, so they're really expecting some gullible, you know, moron. And uh, that's kind of why I wrote the book, Joe, because and I. I want to sort of explain the title, The Followers, Holy Hell, and The Disciple of Narcissistic Leaders. Holy Hell is in reference to the documentary. Yeah. The documentary was released in 2016, and I'm in the documentary. And I encourage people to, to see the documentary and then read the book because it's real archival footage, you know, of us in our natural habitat. So <laughs> you can kind of get an idea as you're reading. You've got visuals. But the thing about the documentary is, you know, you cannot tell a 30 year story in 100 minutes. And so you said, by the way, you were interviewed not to cut you up, but but Will, the documentarian uh, who is also involved, you say that uh, he interviewed you for what, four days? And really, you know, no. <laughs> you or, or he interviewed you for a long time and had to cut it to just a little tiny yeah, smidge yeah. into that. Yeah. So he interviewed me for about four and a half hours of four and a half hours filming. Yeah. Four days, four and a half hours. Seemed felt like. like four days. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, he had 30 years of archival footage. He had about 45 hours of footage that he had to edit down to a hundred minutes and tell a story, which I think he did a beautiful job. You know, he had to portray a story arc. And so you'll see us, you'll see me when I'm 29 years old, you know, and I'm 68 now. So it was a long road. So he had to take all of that footage and tell the progression. And so when people see the film, because he gets to the end really quick in a hundred minutes, People look at it and go, oh, I'd never fall for that. You know, it's like, um, yeah, sure. So the reason why, one of the reasons why I wrote the book is because it doesn't happen like that. I know you can look at that and go, oh, he's so ugly and he's so whatever. And I'd never let him do that to me. Well, you have to understand it's like a frog in warm water. 
You know, it took 20 years for that to unravel. And the filmmaker just had to put it all in 100 minutes. And so if you think that you would not fall for that, just depends on what it is and where it is. Do you think that all of the investors and the lawyers who were involved in Bernie Madoff were stupid or gullible? You know, and that is the thing that I want people to understand. It can happen to anyone. It just depends on what you want. For me, it was spiritual enlightenment. For others, it's great wealth. If a narcissistic sociopath can figure out what you want, they're like chameleons. They will be whatever you want or need them to be. And they're really good at it. Yeah, let's dive into what you were searching for, because for you, you had this great upper class. Well, a lot of people consider it great upper class upbringing. And I love that you telling the story of your dad had learned really to stuff his feelings away. And you said when your mom cried was really the one time you saw him show a lot of feeling. But beside that, not much. But at a young age, you, because of your your household, learned how to mix drinks when you were when you were a kid, and you really didn't <laughs> yeah. have it. Really, wasn't a of this warm. It was a loving household, I think, but it really wasn't this warm place. Yeah, I mean, if anyone has ever seen, you know, the series Mad Men, remember that series? Uh, yeah, absolutely. If, yeah, if you've ever seen that, that was my life. Growing up in the 50s and 60s in Los Angeles, you know, my father was a, he was one of the 12 super lawyers in Los Angeles, and he was a lawyer to the Hollywood and Los Angeles elite. And so both my parents were stunningly attractive, you know, very, very good looking, very charismatic themselves, somewhat narcissistic themselves. You know, we were not the middle class and we weren't the super rich. We were like the... um, the entrepreneur class. But we hung out with the super rich. Uh, I went to private school, you know, and I'm not going to say who I went to school with, but you would recognize the names. Let's put it that way. You know, so I was in the households of the super rich my whole life. Like in Mad Men, in those days in the 50s and 60s, you had children because you had to have them. It's like you, if you didn't have children, there was something wrong with you. You were checking the box. Yeah, check the box. Yeah. Right. And so in a way, we were like the furniture, you know, we were, we were designer family and we were on the surface, really attractive and really dynamic and, you know, all of this stuff. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day about this because they were interested in my life and my past. Many people go for my life as a goal. They think if they're not in an affluent situation, they think that is the pinnacle of life. That is what I'm striving for, is to live in Brentwood, right? Next door, let's see, Gregory Peck was down the street and O.J. Simpson was on the next block. And people have this idea that, oh, you know, that is what I want to strive for, that kind of life. I had the interesting perspective of being there and wanting to get out of there because I saw that there was no real happiness. A lot of it was pretense. And so I was looking for something greater than that, something higher than that. Yeah. You had, you had a couple things because your parents were the, I I love that phrase, the entrepreneur class. You didn't spend a lot of time with them because if they weren't out hustling, they weren't making any money. So they were entertaining, doing other things. So you're looking for this warmth And you find it, you think, in the Catholic Church. And growing up Catholic, you find now you you have wonderful smells. You have rote, um, uh, you know, mass is the same every Sunday, about 85% of it, maybe 90% of it's the same. Like I could see you being very attracted to Catholicism because of the fact that you got this definite warm spiritual feeling. Sure. I was enamored with the saints, you know, and and, in Catholicism, You know, I was reading some history, which was really interesting about the Romans and pantheism. The saints were sort of the Catholics way of having a pantheistic kind of reality to get along with the the Romans, you know, back then. So the saints became sort of demigods because there's beautiful statues and these beautiful paintings of all these saints, and you learn about their stories of martyrdom and all of that. And so I wanted to be a saint. 
not, oh, look at me, aren't I a good person? But I wanted that transcendental experience that they were apparently experiencing. I wanted that direct communion with God and not through a wafer, but yeah. through a real transcendental experience. And so that's what kind of inspired me to look for that. By the time I got in uh, uh, ninth grade, I was a freshman in high school. To the school's credit, they were teaching um, comparative religions. So they were teaching Buddhism and Hinduism and all the isms. And uh, there was this word in Hinduism called nirvana. You know, and I asked the teacher, what does that mean? And he said, well, uh, some yogis in India experience God directly through meditation. And I'm like, is that true? And goes, well, I can, apparently, I'm thinking. I, I can, by the way, Roddy, uh, when I was reading that, when I was reading, he just kind of says that just kind of off the cuff while they experience God directly. I can hear your head spinning around in the book pages. Like, you're like, what? Right. How do I get me some of that? Like, please. Right. You know, and I'm thinking this dude calls himself a theologian. Right. And he knows of people who actually have this experience, but he's not interested in going and finding out more. It's like, okay. So I set out from the time I was 14 and, you know, growing up in LA in the 60s and 70s, you know, there was a lot of drug, sex, and rock and roll, did all of that, you know, did psychedelics, did all kinds of stuff in search for that. I was on that journey for about, uh, another 12 years before I found somebody who said, yes, I have those meditation techniques. And that's how the whole story goes. That's how it starts. Well, and let me ask you about that person. You make your way to Miami, which is a fascinating story. We're not going to get to tell, but when you're in Miami, you get introduced to a woman named Malalia and can you, Malila. can you, Malila. Malila. Oh, I got yeah. that. I got that wrong. Yeah. But can you tell me about that first meeting when you go see Malila, and there's one empty chair? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't want to give too much away, but that is one of my funnier <laughs> chapters. Um, <laughs> okay, so I'm sitting there, you know, and I've done all kinds of things in the searching, you know, and I finally meet this guy, and I'm expounding on life, liberty, and the pursuit of God, and he says, you need to go meet Malila. And I'm like, who? And he, oh, it's this wonderful woman down in South Miami. And she gives what's called satsang, which is, is it means sharing of truth in India or in India, uh, Hindu. And so I go to this little house and I'm late. There's shoes all strewn out on the front porch. So I get the hint and I quietly open the door and the whole room is crap. I mean, it's packed, packed with people. And this is in the 70s. Um, so people are wearing Nehru shirts and their mala beads and stuff like that. And they're all kind of sitting around on the floor or on the couch or whatever. And there were no no chairs, no, no place else to sit, except for there was this little straw kind of chair in the corner. So I sat in it and that was Malila's chair. <laughs> so everybody screamed at me, you know, like that's Malila's chair. And that's kind of like walking into the classroom and sitting at the big desk in the, right. you know, in the front of the class. <laughs> so um, I sat in the guru's chair, first spiritual faux pas, never sit in the guru's chair. <laughs> I thought you were going to take over the place on day one, Radia. Just <laughs> yeah. take over it. You own it. Yeah. 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 I mean, Sure. That's, that's my chair. <laughs> so that was really funny. There was this rejection. She rejected you. You were looking for the spiritual enlightenment. You were on your way to a meeting and she said that you weren't ready. And I was wondering about this early rejection from this group that later on that you would get deeply involved in, in a different, with a different guy, but a very similar group. Why do you think that she rejected you early on? Was a takeaway a part of the process? Like they take it away, yeah. so you want it more? Was it a sales pitch or was that more, were they really rejecting you? I think so. I mean, first of all, I met Jaime, the guru that I ended up with for many years, because he was a friend of Malila's and that Malila introduced me to him. But in hindsight, there's this game that they play. And it is sort of a <clears throat> dangling carrot. And there is sort of a cat and mouse kind of thing that they want to see 
how they can subjugate you, how they can have control over you. So the goal is the four techniques. They give this initiation of this four techniques and they kind of prepare you. That's what it's all about. They prepare you for months and months uh, where you come to satsang and you learn selfless service and you learn to be humble and you learn all of these things in hopes that you will finally be initiated into these four techniques. So that particular night in question you're talking about, she was having a knowing session. I went and she opened the door and said, what do you want? I mean, like, what do you mean? What do I want? <laughs> this is like the night. Yeah, you, you know, know what I want. <laughs> I'm selling Girl Scout cookies. What the <laughs> hell do you think, you know? <laughs> so I said, I want to know God. And she said, you're not ready. <laughs> Slam the door. And I'm like, no, wait, wait. <laughs> I have been on this journey since I was 14. Like, what do you mean I'm not ready? And who are these yokels in there that you're about to initiate? And why are they ready? And I'm not. And I think part of the thing was, my personality. I'm very demonstrative. I was not stupid or uneducated or whatever. So I think the leader really wanted to make sure that they can make me feel less, make me feel inferior, you know, condition yeah. me like that. Yeah. So that when I finally could be initiated, it was th they had finally had enough control over my personality. And I think that's really what it was about. There were some uh, spiritual moments that you had over the years. And I know that uh, in my early days in financial planning, there, as a financial planner, there were some unscrupulous advisors that would teach me like how to use charts and graphs with people as sales techniques to show people stuff that would deeply influence my argument in a way that looked completely scientific. And I learned later was complete BS, was absolutely yeah. complete BS. You had similar things with Jaime. He showed you the blue pearl, I remember. Oh. And I know you've got several of these, but if we can just talk about this one thing, and then later on you find out what the blue pearl really is, which is really sad. Joe, here's the thing that was just so disgusting about the whole journey. I go along, you know, for 20 some odd years, we all did, right? And when I left, I just wanted to not look back. I didn't, I just, I'm done. I did not find out all of those things until I was being interviewed for the film 10 years later. Mm. So it was when this all started to unravel, the real truth is when I found out what this son of a was doing. He was a total fraud from the beginning, a fraud. The four techniques, he was never a disciple of Maharaji's. He lied about, oh, he told stories of his relationship with his master. You know, he never had a master. He's a liar and a con. And so he did these parlor tricks. Remember in the, you know, you've seen stories of the turn of the century, last uh, century, where they would have these soothsayers yes. and they would come in, you know, and they'd have seances. I was just talking about smart people, uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt, like the, the right. dude that built the Vanderbilt fortune got sucked into these, got totally right. sucked into these. Exactly. You know, they'd make the table rise and they'd make the bells ring and all of that stuff. You know, when you go to Disneyland, you're willing to forego your disbelief. You know it's fake, but you're there, you're having fun, you want to go for the ride. So you're you're willing to forego that. But what if you don't know it's fake? And what if everybody in the room, all your best friends and your family, and the person that you admire the most is in on it? It's really weird. So that particular Blue Pearl incident was, it was originally the four techniques, then there's a guru by the name of Muktananda. He was called the Shakti Guru. So Jaime read about Muktananda and read about what Shakti was. And apparently that's when the guru passes his energy to the disciple by touching their forehead. And you'll see that in the film, you know, in the forest where he's doing this thing on this girl. Well, he started to do that. And, and once the Shakti scam was happening... 
in the beginning, he was doing it in the public satsang room, but it wasn't really wasn't really working so well. So he started doing it privately because people weren't getting the, oh, my God, you know, oh, I'm, I'm seeing the light. They weren't yeah. getting that. So he took it in the other room privately. And that's where he would have a person kneel down in front of them, close their eyes. He'd do his little finger on their forehead. And then he would use a flashlight to flash on their eyelids to make them think that they're seeing the light of God, right? And so they would come out of the satsang or the shakti room, oh, some of them crying like they had seen the light, you know, this was all a scam. So for me, Muktananda had talked about the blue pearl and the blue pearl was very special because he would describe the, the soul. When you see the soul, the soul is like in the form of blue light. So for me, he just used a blue light. And Joe, I didn't find this out for 15 years, you know, 10 years after I left. There's just so much, I mean, like with Bernie Madoff and like, and you go through a lot of these big figures in history and these people that follow these people and the waves of disappointment. I just, as you're leaving the cult, I just feel this huge sense of, just disappointment, you know, that yeah. this whole thing that you had been searching for from childhood for a warmer family through Catholicism and the saints and wanting to be a saint to finally feeling like you've got it to believing yeah. that you got it and finding out it was a flashlight yeah. and more is just, yeah. and the stories that we tell about people getting ripped off. I mean, it's the same. It's just this huge disappointment. In the beginning, Joe, it was all about the meditation and it had nothing to do with him. And this is what happens. There's a feedback loop between a narcissist and his followers. And in the beginning, when I was writing this book, uh, I, I entitled it Duped because I was hearing and, and researching all of this and realizing, you know, we were duped. As I started going through the process and the catharsis of writing, I realized, yeah, we were duped. Yeah, we were lied to and all of that. But it really was more about the followers Mm -hmm. Because with a pathological narcissist, there's a feedback loop between the followers and the leader. And so the leader will figure out what you want. And by hook or by crook, they will give it to you, whether it's fake or not. And then in return, they become like, oh, I, oh my God, you fulfilled my dreams. You know, how can I thank you? How can I compliment you? How can I adore you for doing this? So the more you do that, the more they get fed. And the more they get fed, the more the parlor tricks and the more games, because they have to feed that pathology in them. So I realized it's not the leader as much as it is the followers that make the leader. And that's where it becomes dangerous. When you look at Adolf Hitler, Hitler could have never done what he did without the followers. Yeah. He could have never done. One man or one leader cannot do it. It is the followers that do the bidding of the leader. And that's what I found fascinating was that you found out later there were some followers that didn't have any of these existential experiences that other people had. And yet they said they did because you didn't want to be the idiot who was left out. Like if everybody else is feeling something, I got to pretend I do too. Exactly. And it, the preying on the pressure, uh, it's, you're right. It's not the one person. It's the community, the, which if you look going back to Bernie Madoff, I mean, if all your friends are trusting Madoff and these are smart people, these are college professors, these are brilliant people, I should trust this person too. Exactly. And, and that is where it's a sort of a self-feeding trap. Yeah. Then you start to see yourself making possibly unethical decisions. Yeah. Well, I have to tell you, I love you going between your story and the clinical definitions because you dive into narcissists and how they work and you keep going back and forth and you go into historical figures and current culture. And, and it's this, this wild tale you weave, right? The, the book is called the followers, holy hell and the disciples of narcissistic leaders, how my years in a notorious cult parallel today's cultural mania. And I'm imagining it's available everywhere. Well, it's available on Amazon. It's also available on Audible in my voice. Oh, yeah. 
So like, who knows the sarcasm better than I do? Um, <laughs> and <laughs> you can go to my website, which is Radia, spell it right, R-A-D-H-I-A, Gleis, G-L-E-I-S dot com. And you can get it off my website. You can get it at Barnes and Noble. And oh, I've got a right now a special. You can get the ebook, the Kindle for free. So that is cool. And I'm doing a special. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I need reviews. Mm, so if mm -hmm. you get it for free, I appreciate you reading it. But please give me a review or at least stars because you know how Amazon works. Yeah, absolutely. You know? yes. Yeah, yes. That's how they work. So I need those reviews. So it's for free for the next month on Kindle. Go for it and give me a review. That's awesome. And you know what? We're going to link to it two places. Number one, on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. And second, people sign up for our newsletter, the 201. We're going to have all kinds of deep dives into some of the cons and history as well that go along with it. Radia, thanks so much for sharing your story. I think this helps so many people because we never know, right? You don't know. No, and then reading your book, you're able to start seeing the signs and, and hopefully um, save yourself a lot of anguish. So thank you so much. Thanks, Joe, for having me. I really appreciate it. I wasn't sure where this was going on your kind of show, but I'm really glad. I'm delighted to talk to you. <laughs> hey, this is Andy Hill from the Marriage, Kids, and Money podcast. And when I'm not singing Disney karaoke songs with my kids at home, I'm stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Radia for telling her story. You know, gee, finding out after 22 years that all the things that you were hoping for, that this group that you were a part of, that it was all just not there. I mean, that's our, when we find it out after 10 years. <laughs> and it gives you some insight to people that think to themselves, how could I have gotten scammed by this scam artist? We report on these people that get taken advantage of all the time. And you and I've seen some of these schemes. They're very clever. And I think in some cases, you have to really think to yourself how badly you want it to be true. Mm -hmm. versus are you really doing your due diligence? No matter what the story sounds like, what it really is. I mean, this, you know, this guy, this, uh, this gentleman that she was following, I don't know. It was very frustrating to hear. Luckily in finance though, we do have some places we can look maybe with a cult leader. We don't, but in finance, we have some places we can look for clues. Yeah. I think when you're working with a financial institution or a financial person, you know, you just have to be aware of, you know, the background, the firm's background or the person's background, even that, which is certainly publicly available and you have to disclose a whole bunch of stuff, even that people might not disclose the right stuff, you know? So, you know, it's definitely a trust, but verify. I don't think that with financial stuff, I don't think that you should be blindly investing and in dumping your life savings into a portfolio managed by other people unless you have the mechanism to to check in on it from time to time and some easy stuff right like obviously the biggest thing in our um sphere as of late had been the bernie madoff thing what was the key takeaway from that which was you need to make sure your money is at a third party custodian yeah third party statements it has to the money has to you have to get a statement from schwab or td or vanguard or fidelity or you know whatever because you can't manipulate those and if your broker is saying, hey, I'm going to put together the statement for you, it's totally fine. You know, we use technology to kind of piece things together and you've got money in 10 different places and we'll throw it together in one form for you so it looks nice. But that doesn't take the, it's not the substitute for your actual bank statement. It's not the substitute for your actual 401k statement or brokerage statement. So you're working with an advisor, make sure that advisor uses a third party person, which virtually everyone does. So that's easy. It's an easy thing to do. That covers 95% of your bases. It's a good start. Yeah. And, and then the rest of the stuff is, if it sounds too fishy, it probably is. You know, I mean, again... Well, and even if it doesn't sound fishy, if it just sounds flipping great... Well, that's what I mean. Like, there's... If it's too good to be true, it probably is. If it's something very esoteric and, like, off the wall, like, oh, all the rich people do this, it's like, the rich people just buy ETFs, man. They don't... They, you know... Yeah, those, those statements, like, this is what banks don't want you to know. Mm -hmm. Like when you hear that, you're like, uh, banks don't care what you know. Yeah. Like financial firms don't care what you know. And, right. you know, we talked earlier on that every rose has its thorn. <laughs> that, that, is that the take? Is it, that could be the takeaway. That's got to be one of the takeaways. For this, that's a horrible a bonus, takeaway. bonus takeaway. But, but if somebody offers you the big upside 
and they gu- and they give me and gotcha to everything exactly so and they guarantee the gotcha? no downside yeah you, you need to run there's got well i mean there's has to be something like you just have to keep pushing for it i was watching flipping through channels this past weekend and there was a commercial for an annuity company which was perfect timing right the market's down 20 percent. so here come the annuity fear. here guy. comes some fear and you know listening to him talk like oh yeah you're guaranteed all the upside of the market no the, you never get anything less than zero da, 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 da. and it's like all right that sounds wonderful that sounds great and I'm, it, that is factually accurate, but you're missing some pieces to that. <laughs> it's like, well, you don't get all of the upside. You get 25% of the upside. Oh, okay. And also it's going to cost 2% a year. So you go, okay, well, hold on a second. So the S&P average is 10. If I get 25% of the upside, that's two and a half. And it's costing me two a year. And by the way, I bet the two comes out after they've credited you the 25. Sure. So you go, okay, well, you're not going to go down anything that's 100% true. You're just not going to go up. You're just not going to, you know, the, so there was the gotcha. But like it that. sounds so, like, because the mechanism is the stock market, it sounds like you're going to go up. Yeah, so it sounds good. You know, also yeah. PS, you can't touch your money for 15 years and I'm going to get a 32% commission on your money. Like that, all that stuff's forgotten about. You know what I mean? But to your point, it's all disclosed. It's all in that 700 page booklet, you know, but the SEC and FINRA and insurance companies thinks that, it's a really great idea to give you more paper. You know, it's not that you know, we just have a new ADV this year or a couple of years ago called the Form CRS, and that was the that was the missing piece. The SEC said, you know what's not enough? There's not enough disclosure. So let's make a compact disclosure of that big disclosure, and it's three pages. I remember getting my and nobody uh, reads it by the way. Yeah, I remember getting closing documents for our house. We moved back to Texarkana, and every time I do a close. I just realized what a sham more paper is Mm. because every single one of those five bajillion forms is made to protect people. And what does the closing person do? Uh, Skips to the, this basically says these three things. I'm like, there's no way they used 80 pages to explain the three things that you're telling me. Like there's no way and sign there. Okay. Then this basically explains this. It's basically explains. None none of those are, and this is how you're protected by signing all this stuff. It's like, this ensures the title company doesn't get screwed. If you did something bad, this makes it so the the bank who wrote the loan doesn't get screwed by the government in case they did something bad. This is telling, you know, this is protecting the bank, the brokerage company, the real estate guy, the title company, all those people. Where's where's mine? So, hey, let's draw Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, Doug, they put what you value first. He has no idea because he didn't bring up the spreadsheet. He had. He, We're at the Hampton Inn, and he left the spreadsheet back in the basement. He did he? Uh, this guy knows how to roll with the punches. He valued the fact that after a, a series of some pretty spectacular pars today on the golf course. After very specifically telling him, do not block it right into the into the crap, he just immediately shanked it right into the crap. Right so, into the... But then it made a nice happened. recovery. Well, yeah, and somebody else followed me into the crap I didn't on say, the same tee. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was not a good showing by OG today. I'd say uh, it's difficult. I would value a straight golf ball at this point. Actually, we used that one already. We I, just used that like couple of episodes ago I still would that value you it. value hitting 285 straight down the middle with a slight draw. He found to get it. that sweet, That's sweet quickly- roll, <laughs> leaving me with an easy gap wedge approach shot to a soft dead flat green. We're on. We've to- used it. No, I just have a crack cracker Jack. Memory. We're on to sell 17 C now in the spreadsheet. Yeah, exactly. Reg- so does Haven Lifeline do any of those things? R- regale us. Is, is, is there a new one? Is there a new one today? Or do, is that, do we get the recycle one? Is that uh, where we're going with? Uh, could I guess, it be free refills on gravy at the Sizzler? It just, just sounds delicious. Yeah, skip gravy the boat. skip the rest of the Sizzler. Just go with the gravy, like Gaffigan said. You know, yeah. Just carry around the KFC. You get gravy. all of it. You get your fats. You get your proteins. You get all of it. You get a little bit of fiber, all in one delicious liquid. Mm, yes, and, and I'm I'm sure that's going to be fantastic on your on your medical exam. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, your blood work as is As long as crazy. my insurance company doesn't find out about this, yeah. everybody's happy. But that is why they've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. I'm going to go ahead and do the read now, if you guys don't mind. Head to stackybenjamins.com slash havenlife now to get a free quote. Go ahead and do it. Unless you've been drinking gravy the last two days, then I'd say maybe wait a day. I, I love what they're doing because their application's simple. It's online. You get an instant coverage decision. Prices are affordable. And of course, uh, you know, we talked about... Maybe not know what the company's up to. Well, all Haven Life policies issued by the parent company, Mass Mutual, more than 160 years old. Today, we're going to throw out the Haven Lifeline to our friend Lacey. Say hi, Lacey. Hey, Joe, OG, and the gang. 
My husband is a huge fan and has had our two-year-old son listening to you since the wound. Our son now even does a little dance every time your intro comes on. It's our anniversary coming up, and I know there is nothing more my husband would want than to hear my voice on your podcast and to get a t-shirt. He's a size medium. So here goes my question. We have several nieces and nephews, and instead of gifts, we put about $100 a year per kid into an ally savings account for them that they can have when they're 18. I'm wondering what we can do instead of a savings account so that their money will grow more. We don't want to invest in anything too risky and would prefer not to do something that would make their parents have to be too involved in the process either. Thanks for your help and thanks for making a financial podcast I end up getting to listen to all the time, tolerable and maybe even a little enjoyable. First of all, if they're making their child listen to us, Department of Social Services is going to be knocking on their oh, door. Oh, easy, minute. man. This is the best stuff. This is what, imagine the, the investors they're going to have in the family. It's going to be incredible. Okay. It's going to be great. Plus, of all the best dad jokes. I mean, it's like a I think I think they should make it like the Hunger Games and get all the nieces and nephews together. <laughs> And one niece or nephew gets all the money. The one that sticks it out. <laughs> Did you hear to the part the about longest? low risk? Did that just go right over your head? Yeah, no. So a couple of thoughts. I think that when it comes to investing, it kind of sort of depends on the goal and, the, and, and what your purpose of it is. Like if you're trying to say, hey, I, wanna, I want my niece to get this money at 18 so that they can use it for college is a different goal then I want them to have this money so that they have accumulated a bunch of money by the time they're 18 so that they can continue to accumulate it. And so if your outcome is I need the money in cash by the time I'm 18, then yeah, once you get to about three years out, that money needs to stay in cash and that's all there is to it. Interest rates are low here. If you want high rates of interest, you can put your money in the bank in Russia like we talked about before. If you're trying to teach kids about investing, I think this is a great exercise too. We use Stockpile in our house. Joe, I know that you have used this for your kiddos and for your uh, nieces and nephews. And uh, we've, even, we've even given the Fintern Stockpile. Yeah, yeah. I love it because it makes them kind of pick it based on the brands that they recognize. You know, they're buying Xbox stock, not Microsoft. They're buying Hershey Kisses. I guess Hershey's the same. Or, the, you know, they're buying Captain Crunch instead of whatever. You know, they, they see the brands that they recognize and they get to buy that buy into that company. So that's a great website, I think. Little spendy, 99 cents a trade. So if you put 100 bucks in there, you're going to get $99 and one cent worth of stock, but it does allow you to do partial shares. Um, and then you let the kids pick it. Just whatever they pick, they pick. And that's the outcome that they get to have. And that's a little bit of a lesson there. If it's anything other than that, and you're saying, well, I want it, I want this money to kind of be a start for them for an investing platform, then I, I would argue that your investing time horizon does allow you to be aggressive. And, you know, if you've got a five-year-old and they're going to need the money when they're 70, for crying out loud, you can invest it as aggressively as you want. And in which case, just go ahead and pick a, you know, a, a Russian ETF, Russian ETF. Yes. More specifically, a broad-based S&P 500 type fund would be more than adequate. You know, if you wanted a little bit more aggressiveness, you could use a small company fund, uh, one that specializes in smaller companies, but there's going to be a lot more ups and downs with that. So just kind of those three different things. You'd need the money at age 18, in which case you got to kind of time it out so that once you get about three years out, that money's sitting in cash. If you're trying to teach a lesson, I would use Stockpile and kind of, I mean, as, as little as eight years old, I think, or seven years old, you can talk about how you own part of Amazon. You are you get to be a part of that company you own and the benefits that go with that. And you can te start teaching that very early. And and if it's really just to set them up over a long term, you know, I don't know why you wouldn't use an ETF or a mutual fund and use an S&P fund or, or a uh, small company fund. Um, as far as like having the family involved, I would say that you will need some something involved with the family. You'll, you're going to need social security numbers and all sorts of stuff like that. But that shouldn't be too onerous to get, especially if the aunts and uncles already know that's coming. So, yeah, Actually, go ahead. No, I, I like that. I, well, I'm glad you pointed out the time horizon because she had stipulated or hoped something low risk, but you're actually advocating you probably want to bring in a little bit of risk because you're going to get greater growth and these swing for the fence. The kids don't need it right away. So, this is the time to be risky. Yeah. If, I mean, if, if that's the point is to have it so that they're starting out on a good foundation and the purpose is for them to use it for retirement. 
you know, or a new but house he, or their kid's college or whatever. I was going to say, but even sooner than that, right? Even if, if they're only going to get access to it when they're 21, you can still afford to be a little bit risky, right? Yeah, it just depends on the on how old the kids are. But again, if it's more of a lesson or if it's more of a, I need the money at 18, then, then you got to dial it back quite a bit. But I also think if it's, I need the money at 18 or I want the money at 18, if that's the number one reason you go with that broad-based index, if the goal is a lesson in learning more about how companies work and how the, the instruments work, then I go more with a stockpile approach. Love it. Yeah. Thanks for that question, Lacey. And uh, happy anniversary to you and your husband. And uh, he will hear you on the Stacking Benjamin Show, which we're, we're proud of. And hopefully we get to see both of you at a event, an event, at an event. Mm-hmm. Yes, That's- an event coming up. Not A-N-N-E though. No, no, nope. Uh, that's that's Anne's Anne's event. event, and we're we're not no part of that. No one's invited to. We're that. the Stacking Benjamins event. Stackingbenjamins dot com slash stacked, and uh, hope to see you as we go around the country. Tomorrow we're in Los Angeles, uh, so come join us in Los Angeles uh, Tuesday night, and on Wednesday Portland, Oregon, Thursday Seattle, and then uh, watch out Miami because we're coming for you. Uh, early the following week. Because that's a hell of a leg, Seattle to Miami. Enjoy that flight. You're trying to stack up the miles? Is that what you were trying to do? That is, well, you got to make, you got to make the flight. And I wanted to avoid the winter weather and Seattle doesn't get snow a lot. And then I wanted to do the Southeast next. So it's, it's the one time that I used all those miles that I've been, that I've been saving up and I'll be sitting up there in what we call the OG section of the plane. Ooh. Yes. Yes. All right. That's going to do it for today. We got a bunch of people to thank. What a great way to start our next eight weeks. This is going to be an adventure because, uh, literally and figuratively, either you or I, or you, me and Doug, we're all going to be in uh, hotel rooms or maybe I'll just be in a hotel room or you two in hotel rooms. It just got creepy. I'm I'm not, I'm not trying to say that. I'm just saying this is going to be like duct taping a podcast for the next which is a months. lot different than the last thousand <laughs> that's, episodes that's right yeah <laughs> yeah we've already got uh questions in the basement on facebook asking what's the over under on how many hotel rooms we get kicked out of <laughs> <laughs> well hopefully this isn't number one but we still got <laughs> doug's credits to go so <laughs> the game's not up yet they probably only called dur- during just after the beginning and just after the trivia so maybe third time's the charm we'll see but last but not least, if you don't want duct tape on your financial plan, huh? Ninja. JB Smooth right there. Right there. Uh, OG and his team are taking clients, and especially in a time of volatility, if you find yourself not sleeping or, or just not understanding where the market's going, well, then it's probably time to make your team better. StackingBenjamins.com slash OG. That's it for us. Hope to see you guys soon. Doug, what should we have learned today? Well, Joe, first, are the people handling your money working some magic? Do you find yourself loving the way they talk to you? Make sure you're not just falling for the way they talk. They might not have your best interest at heart. Second, you never know where Mr. Rogers' trolley is going to take you. No matter how tiny your first job, if you take it seriously, you might end up with a net worth of $40 and a pretty sweet car. But the big lesson? You know... When I think about it, the only difference between Mr. Rogers and us is that damn trolley. Hey, OG, if we had a trolley in the basement, ratings are going to go right through the roof. So you can expect to see that on my expense report any day now. Thanks to Radia Gleese for joining us. Follow someone to pick up her book, The Followers, today. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2022, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch, with help from Joe, me, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. After you listen to our show, check out the 201 Deep Dives, written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. 
Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So, say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. Both she and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. Not only should you not take advice from these dorks, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. I don't know. It is, it is very fun doing this, uh, this way on this little makeshift table in this weird room. It's we're, a lovely room. Well, we're in this room that has uh, a bed over on one side and then way the hell over there is a sofa and there's this I don't, long narrow table. Yeah. Just, just like, like a buffet or something. I know. It's very strange. I set out all the pizza on the buffet. I don't know what that's about. Ooh, pizza. But I'm sure, you know, you always think when you go on tour that things are going to be, or, you know, things are going to be hairy. Stuff isn't going to work out the way that you think. Mine actually started before the tour, which shows you how this is going to go. Uh, Cheryl and I took a very nice getaway trip to get a little quiet before all this stuff to Maine and people are like, why do you go to Maine in yeah, the middle that's of what you just made their whole tourism board go, they bought it. They're coming. <laughs> we found them. And actually it's funny about that, Doug, the, the town of Kenny Bunkport has a February celebration called paint the town red. And it's all this Kenny Bunkport's for lovers kind of thing. Right. It was, it was really cool that, well, the neat thing was, is that being from Michigan, I love winter. Oh, oh gee, you don't love winter. He does not. Uh, no, no. So when I was in Michigan, I wanted to, to get a week of sunshine at least by going south. And it totally made winter bearable. Yep. Now I told Cheryl, I really, really, really just want to get a little snow. So we go to Maine. Never been to Kenny Bunkport. I've been to Bar- Bahaba, Bahaba, as they call it. Kenny Bugport was awesome. But what was even better was we fly in the first day and there's no snow. That part wasn't great. Mm. But everything's closing early. Because the next day was a hell of blizzard and we were stuck at this inn with this beautiful fireplaces. Like we went out and took a couple of walks. There was one restaurant that was open. Thank God. There was one restaurant was, that was open. We had a great dinner there. There was hardly anybody there. Half the tables were full. Because it's winter in Maine. Because it's a blizzard in Maine. And then that weekend, it was nice. And we flew home and it was nice. However, we get halfway home and this is where the start of this ugliness begins I discovered that on my American Airlines app, there's a thing that says your bags are on your way. And you click that and it shows where your bags are. And because our plane to Shreveport was delayed, the second leg of our of our expedition home, I'm bored. So I click on that link and it shows one bag is sitting in Charlotte with me and the other one's being loaded on a plane to Dulles to Washington, D.C. Yeah. In theory, that technology shouldn't be necessary because your bag should always be within about a thousand feet of where you are. Like, Why develop that app for situations just like this? Just so I can watch American Airlines screw me over. And then you can't do anything about it. I go up to the gate agent. I'm like, excuse me. This She's like, I I, I there's nothing it's it's gone it is it is gone so my bag ended up in dulles and the bad news was was that like the shoes i wanted to wear 
I bought a new pair of pants because God knows I'm going to look way better in these pants. You need that. Yeah. Yes. And, and especially the bag I really, really want it. It's my, anyway, even the before, one with all the stickers on it from all the, the cool places the you've stickers. been, you yes. can't lose that bag. Yeah. So I can brag yeah. about all the places I've been You're a travel bragger, by the way, if you want, if you want to have some fun, autumn, my daughter told me that cause she started doing that on her bag. And then we began going to uh, national parks and I started sticking those stickers on. And it's just fun for me. $2 thing. But if I lose my bag before the tour starts, like <laughs> foreshadowing, like, like we're still at T minus. Yeah. Like, where's it going to go from here? Yeah. We've already lost OG. That's where it's going to go. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> you should never check a bag. Everybody knows that. Problem solved. Get an inside look at Hollywood with Michael Rosenbaum. Let's get inside of Kristen Krug. You would do anything if you love the role. If it was healthy, I would never want to hurt myself for a role. Because there's some roles. There's like that guy on Walking Dead. They say he would. You know, he didn't shower a lot. He smelled on set. He wanted to be that kind of character. Could you see yourself doing that? What's the point? Isn't that what makeup's for? <laughs> inside of you with Michael Rosenbaum. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.